let us pray our father we thank you very much for the beginning of the series of bible teachings for the congress this year we're asking lord that you open our eyes to see the glorified christ and to know lord that christ the head of the church risen ascended up to heaven is glorious and glorified and we're asking oh lord that as we look at the pages of scripture looking at christ in his coming glory you also so bless and enrich our lives so that this word will once again lift up our hearts to know who we believe and to know that is able to keep us until that final day lord we just open our hearts to you as we look at the scriptures today reveal christ more to every one of us that with courage conviction and confidence will be able to go out there in the world and declare who jesus is and as we declare who jesus is Many people will see the glory of Christ and will come to know you, Lord, as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you give us freedom, liberty of entrance, that we may declare the word as we ought to declare it. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I thought you will say, Amen. You know, when you come together like this, you have been preachers, now you are congregation. And what you expect your congregation to do is what you ought to do. Can I have a good amen again? Yeah. I welcome you formally to the Congress we have this year. As you have noticed, if you've got the program, and the theme of the Congress is Leadership Development. And we'll be starting with Bible teaching. And if you happen to be a late comer and you don't always show up for the first message, well, we're not going to be waiting for you. It means that this time you'll have the honor of missing the Bible teaching, if that's an honor. And we'll be talking about Christ in the series of bible teachings that we have at this time and you'll see that the series if you look at your program we're starting with the revelation of christ's future glory then the second one christ's grace glory and dominion and then the certainty of christ's second coming then number four will be the vision of the glorified Christ. And as we bring everything to a conclusion, we'll be talking about the glorified Christ and his glorious church. I pray that the Lord himself will reveal who Christ is to you. And you'll come to appreciate Christ as well as the word of God itself. We're taking our Bible teaching series from Revelation chapter 1 revelation chapter 1 and i encourage you before you come read that revelation chapter 1 over and over and over again and see what treasure we have in this revelation chapter 1 open your bible with me the revelation of jesus christ which god gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and the saint and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are reaching therein, for the time is at hand. Those are the three verses we're looking at today as we consider the revelation of Christ's future glory. As we begin this enriching study in this last book of the Divine Library, the Revelation, the last book in the Holy Bible, 
And you want to understand, and there is no other book exactly like the book of Revelation. Although the other books talk about Christ. For example, Matthew talks about Christ. Mark, Luke, John, they talk about Christ. But about Christ is in incarnation and humiliation. When you come to Revelation, you are talking about the glorification of Christ. Yes, the Acts of the Apostles talk about Christ. As to what his disciples did by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you're talking about things past. About the power of Christ. When you come to Revelation, you are talking about things future. About Christ. What Christ will be. Oh yes, the epistles. Starting from the Romans to the Corinthians to the Galatians and to the Ephesians and to the Philippians and Colossians and to the Thessalonians and, and to the Timothys and all the others, they talk about Christ, about what Christ accomplished on the cross and the meaning of the cross and the significance of the cross and the implication of the cross of Christ for us today. But when you come to Revelation, yes, he's still talking about Christ, but he's talking about something different, about the Lamb. Not the lamb that just was slain, but the lamb that is the lion of the tribe of Judah that is reigning over everything. That's why uh, the book of Revelation is not exactly like all the other books of the, oh, of the New Testament. The richness of this book, the depth of this book, the height of this book, the greatness of this book. And we're losers for not studying this book it is the book in which all things in the bible find an echo all things in the bible everything you've read from genesis all through to jude they find a reverberation a consummation for example what begins in genesis ends in revelation in Genesis, you have the commencement of heaven and earth. In Revelation, the consummation of heaven and earth. In Genesis, you have the entrance of sin and curse. In Revelation, you have the end of sin and curse. In Genesis, is the dawn of Satan and his activities. In Revelation, is the doom of Satan and his activities. In, in Genesis, you have the tree of life relinquished. But in Revelation, the tree of life is regained. In Genesis, death enters. In Revelation, death exits. In Genesis, you have sorrow beginning. But in Revelation, you have sorrow banished. In Genesis, you have the Savior promised. In Revelation, the Savior preeminent. What begins in Genesis ends is consummated comes to its climax when you come to the book of revelation this book of revelation concentrates on christ's coming in his glory with all the attendant events and the circumstances the first time that jesus christ our lord and savior came into this world how did he come he was born in a manger and then he was carried for protection to another place and then he came back then he was hidden and then at the age of 12 he came out and he was at the temple and at the age of 30 he was revealed to the nation of israel and all those three and they have years humiliation persecution subjection and then eventually everything ended up with sacrifice but the, the very central scene as we look at jesus christ in his earthly ministry is a humiliation but he's coming again and when he comes again he'll not be coming in humiliation and servitude and with sacrifice he'll be coming glorified because this christ that comes again will be coming in the glorious form exaltation it will not be as he came at the beginning the first time when he came many saw him and when they saw him, they didn't know what to make of him. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And they're going to be surprised when he comes again. Because when he comes, the next time, he'll come and every eye shall see him. And all that will see him, will see him exalted and glorified. And there are three points we're going to look at in this study today. 
And you know, we have three verses there. Verse 1, that gives us a point. Verse 2, that gives us another part of the message. Verse 3, gives us another part of the message. Three points. Number 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Point number 2, the record of John about Christ. The record of John about Christ. Christ. Then point number three is the reward of justified and just Christians. The reward of justified and just Christians. Point number one. Look at verse one again. In verse one it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where we got that point number one. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at it again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto him, to show unto his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Hey, look at those words there. The revelation. The word revelation actually means the unveiling, the uncovering, the manifestation. It's making something that had been hidden, something unknown, something that people could not imagine, and there's no way they could know it without being revealed unto them, uncovering it, unveiling it, manifesting it, making it manifest, visible before them. The revelation of Jesus Christ. What you are going to read in chapter 1 and what you read in chapters 2, 3, 4 up till the last chapter is about Jesus Christ. But then it's the revelation of Jesus in this sense. Number 1, it's about Jesus. It's concerning Jesus. Number 2, it's coming from Jesus. And it's going to the disciples and the servants and the people who believe and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And that tells you, number one, the central theme. The central theme of this whole book, of this whole prophecy, is Jesus Christ himself. Then it tells us something which God gave unto him. That tells you the divine source. All that we are going to read, chapter 1, all through to chapter 22, which God gave unto him, the divine source of the message itself, the divine source of the prophecy itself. And then it says, he gave it unto him to show unto his servants, to show unto his servants the privileged recipients. And the people actually that the Lord has sent, this book of Revelation to any other people of God, the servants, doulos in the Greek, that means the born slaves. That means the people that voluntarily, wholeheartedly, and they have yielded to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they say, we are yours, we are following you, we are disciples, and we are going to do everything at your command, which he gave, revealed unto his servants. And that's why if you, if you have read, uh, you know, some people on the revelation, the secular, nominal theologians that do not have the servanthood, the humility, the yieldedness to Christ, they don't understand revelation. They don't understand all the interpretation. Everything is kind of jumbled up and mingled up and confused unto them. Why? Because the key is not given to them. And as Jesus told his own disciples, to you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom. But to them it's like in parables. It's like in symbols. Because the privileged recipients are the servants of the Lord. And then it says it's showing them things which must shortly come to pass the prophetic nature of everything you are going to read. You see, right from verse 1, it's telling you what to expect. It's telling you this is not a book of history. This is not a book of allegory. This is not a book of just simple illustrations. It's a book of prophetic nature. 
and is telling you things that have not happened yet, which must surely come to pass. And then he sent and signified it, the symbolic communication. That as you read the book of Revelation, you'll find a lot of symbols there. In fact, uh, this book is so symbolic that all the symbols you could find in Daniel, all the symbols you could find in Zechariah, all the symbols you could find in, you know, the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ, in all the 404 verses of the Revelation, you do not have in any other book of the New Testament, any other book of the Old Testament, just these 404 verses of the Revelation contain so many symbols. So many symbols. And because it says it was given unto the servants to show prophetically the things that will shortly come to pass. And he said, and he signified it by his angels. You'll find that in this book, angels just come up every time. And you have angels in chapter 4. Angels show up again in chapter 5. In chapter 6, in chapter 7, in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. You find angels everywhere because this is through angelic communication to you that is sent and is signified it by his angel unto John, his servant, the apostolic channel. Want you to pass all this through to the church and to the people of God. He used the apostolic channel. Uh, think about it then. The central theme. That's Jesus Christ. The divine source is coming from God. The privileged recipients, the servants of the Lord. The prophetic nature, the things which must surely, shortly come to pass, and the symbolic communication, because it says he said and he signified it, and then the angelic involvement sent it through his angel unto John, the apostolic channel. As we look at this, look at it again. I'm reading verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant john and the point here the central thing here is the word revelation the revelation of jesus christ and as you open as you open this book the key is right there. You know there are people that say hey, you can never understand the book of Revelation. Because it's like it's closed up. It's like uh, the key of understanding is not given to anybody. Then it will not be a revelation. If it is a revelation, then it's unveiled. It's uncovered. It's manifest. It's visible. It's understandable. Because it says it's a revelation. And so that means then if you are a real child of God and you are part of the recipients that the Lord had given this to, you will know that this is actually a revealed truth, a revealed entity. That word revealed, that word revelation. And see the way it is used in the Word of God, in, in the New Testament, especially in Second Thessalonians chapter chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When the Lord shall be revealed. What does that mean? Oh, the Lord that you have believed but you have not seen. The Lord you have believed but you cannot see him physically now. But then there's going to be a revelation, an unveiling, an uncovering, a manifestation. It will come and you will see him when he shall be revealed from heaven. And what are we reading in the book of Revelation? Is revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ from heaven and from glory. In verse 10, the first part of verse 10. When he shall come 
to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe that means when you when he comes in his glory then you will see that is the glorified christ and already i read it to you that this revelation has a divine source always always when you think about knowing christ making christ manifest making him visible and revealing him to you you have a divine part in making that revelation onto our hearts onto us even when he was in his earthly ministry like in matthew chapter 16 Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. And it says unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Listen to this now. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed each unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. There's a revelation here of who Christ is. Who do you say that I am? Others say you are Jeremiah. Others say you are Elijah. Others say you are one of the prophets. All right, now, hey, those people, that's what I'm telling you. That those people that do not really have the Spirit of God, they are not part of his servants. They are not recipients of the revelation of who Christ is. Even as it was at that time in his earthly ministry. But the people that are the doulos, the born slave, the servant, the yielded uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father reveals Christ unto them. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. But my Father who is in heaven it takes that divine source to reveal christ unto us in luke chapter 17 luke 17 verse 13 even thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed he's talking about a second coming and he's talking about the very fact that he will be seen he will be known he will be visible and he said, the Son of Man shall be revealed. And as you come to Luke chapter 10, Luke 10, from verse 21, Luke chapter 10, from verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Uh, do you understand now again? It says, you have hidden these things from the wise people of the world, from the prudent people of the world. And that's why they come, they come to the book of Revelation. Uh, they cannot understand. As they read from chapter 1 and they go to 2, 3, 4, 5 and all those chapters, those people, those some believers, although they are wise, is, there's no vocabulary there that they don't understand. And they are simple, simple vocabulary because John, John always wrote very simple terminologies, vocabularies, terms. But when it comes to understanding the depth of what John had written, the wise, the prudent, they cannot understand. This revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things that must shortly come to pass, and he signified it by the hand of the angel unto John his servant. It is a privilege of the servants of God to understand that even in the earthly ministry of Jesus, he was saying, Father, I thank you. And this is the way it ought to be, that you have hidden it. You have not given the key unto the wise and the prudent, but you have revealed it unto these babes. Babes, they have the life of the divine parents. 
babes because they are born of God. Babes because they, they fully belong to the Lord. And you have found it fit to reveal it unto them. Even so, Father, for so it seemeth good in thy sight. And then in verse 23, why don't you go to verse 22? It says, All things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son. And he to whom the Son will reveal him. It takes this revelation. You cannot just come with your mind and your knowledge and your vocabulary and, you know, your study of English language or any other language and understand this revelation. Unto whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples. And he said privately, Blessed are the ears which see the things which ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. This is a special revelation given unto the people of God. First Peter, in First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the unveiling, at the uncovering, at the manifestation, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When he comes, eh, there are things going to be revealed. Well then, as I uh, already told you, that this book that you are studying, that is revelation, is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Well then, what kind of revelation are we seeing here? We're looking at Christ here in his second coming. In exaltation, in glorification. How does the book of Revelation reveal Christ? Is revealed, number one, as the risen glorified Son of God in the midst of the church. That's what you'll see. Number two, is revealed as a lamb in heaven, publicly invested with authority and all power. Number three, is revealed as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see him riding, you see him conquering, you see him ruling. You see him as the king of kings and the lord of lords. Number four, he's revealed as the judge upon the throne of the universe. Number five, he's revealed as the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. Number six, he's revealed as the ruler over all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of Christ our Lord. And then number seven is revealed as the Alpha and the Omega. Revealed as the beginning, as the end. Revealed as the one that is and was and is to come. It's revealed as the first and the last. In this book then, as you come to this book of Revelation, you'll be finding that Christ is a glorified one. And I pray he'll be glorified in your life in Jesus' name. This Jesus Christ. It's not only that something is revealed about him, but he also reveals something to us. What does he reveal? So that, uh, you know, this book is actually a book of revelation. He reveals to us the spiritual condition of the churches. And he reveals, number two, uh, the necessity of love and holiness in his church. Because he revealed to that church, you have left your first love. And I will want you to remember how you believed and to come back and do the first works again. Number three, he reveals the promise of eternal inheritance for the overcomer. Number four, he reveals the ultimate triumph and reward of the overcomers, revealing the final end of political setup in the world. Number six, he reveals the end of human history. 
Behold, I make all things new. And every sin that had a beginning in Genesis, the sin, the curse, the Satan, the sorrow, the sadness, the evil, the conflict, the disaster, everything ends by the time Revelation ends. And then he reveals the power and the program of the coming Antichrist. And he reveals the final triumph of Christ over Satan and over evil completely. And then he reveals the glory of Christ and the victory of Christ's power over all forces, human or demonic. And he also reveals the final judgment of Satan. He reveals the final end of sin. And he reveals the glories of Christ, Christ's kingdom on earth. And he reveals the ultimate triumph of God's saving purpose, Revelation. So then, as you come to this book, you are coming to a book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Point number two. That's in verse two. Look at it. Verse two. Who bear record? Who bear record? Who is bearing record? John. What's he bearing record about? Who is he bearing record about? Christ. That's why point number two is the record of John about Christ. The record of John about Christ, verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things, all things which he saw. John bore record and he bore record about Jesus Christ and as a faithful lawyer with witness, John had always been bearing record of the Lord. In the Gospels, John bore record. In the Epistles, John bore record. He bore record at that time of his incarnation and of his humiliation, as well as of the salvation and the sanctification, and also of the power that he gives on the ch to the church. He bore record on the very fact that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And then he is not going to bear record that oh, I have no record already that Jesus is Savior. I want to bear record now that he is supreme. I have born record about his atonement. I want to bear record now about his exaltation. I have faithfully born record about his humiliation. How they crucified him and how he cried even on the cross. I have born record about his suffering. Now I want to bear record about his supremacy, exaltation and glorification. The revelation of Jesus Christ. He saw everything. That's why the Lord told him, look at verse 19. Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen. John, what have you seen? As you look at chapter 1 alone, you see that he saw Christ. And he saw the glory of Christ. And this John that had been leaning upon the bosom of Jesus Christ, when he saw Jesus in glory, he fell down as if he were dead. Go and write about that John and bear record concerning that. And then the things which are the churches of Asia Minor. John, I'm giving you a record concerning the church in Ephesus and the one in Smyrna and the one in Pagamos and the one in Tatira and the one in Sardis and the one in Laodicea. All those churches, I'm giving record, bear the record, what you have seen. And then in that verse 19, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's prophetic, that's still future. The things which you have seen, you've seen the glory of Christ, bear record. And the things which are concerning the state and situation of the churches, bear record. And the things which shall be hereafter, still in the future, and they are not fulfilled yet, and they are still going to be fulfilled, bear record. And this John said, and I bear record, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things which he saw. As you look at this, you, uh, you look at the faithfulness of John 
as he has been bearing record. Please come back to the Gospels. In John chapter 21. John chapter 21, verse 24. This is the disciple who testified of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. A faithful witness he was. And now he comes to the epistles and he's still bearing record. Always bearing record. And isn't it uh, wonderful because uh, when you are faithful at one level, then God gives you another opportunity and privilege, and then you are faithful there, and God gives you another privilege, opportunity, and you bear record also, and he gives you another privilege again. And that's what happened to John. It's always been a faithful witness, a faithful pen man, a faithful person that, that will bear record. And in First John, First John, Reading there from chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested, revealed, uncovered, unveiled to us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And you can see it's seen, we saw it. And that's why we're declaring it unto you. And we're bearing witness. And he was, so, he was so confident about the witness he was bearing because he knew that he wasn't alone. In John chapter 5, 1 John, 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, reading from verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And John said, I'm in good company. I'm bearing record. But you know what? I'm not the only one bearing record. The Father, the Word, that's the Word personified as Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost, they bear record in heaven. And these three, it says, are one. And then in verse 8, and there are three that bear record on earth. Bear witness on earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If we, re if we receive the evidence that people give on earth, how about this one? How about what we are reading in Revelation? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, so that it will be shown to his servants, and the things that must shortly come to pass, and he, signed, and he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John, if we receive the record and the witness of men. The witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his son. And so what you are seeing here, it is not the first time, don't you see? While Jesus was coming out of the water, then John had borne witness. John had said, I saw him. And when I see him coming, I see that that is the one that will be the lamp of the world. Behold the lamp of God that takes away the sin of the world. But, uh, the, the witness of men is something, but I bear the witness of God. As he came out of the water, the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If we receive then the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he testified of his son. In John chapter 15, gospel. John chapter 15. Reading there in verse 27. John 15, 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from 
the beginning. What we've seen, what we've handled, what our eyes beheld, that word of life, we saw it, we participated in it, and we bear record. And that record is true. And so when the Lord appointed John, he appointed him specially so that he will bear record. And that's why this revelation given to John is a full disclosure of Christ's glorification. And this revelation disclosure is coming from God and coming to us. And as I told you already, and you've seen it already, that it was given by signs and symbols to John. And it was revealed by angels. John was a trusted servant who was chosen to reveal and to declare the revelation. Not a revelation, not some revelation. The revelation, the very climax of it to the church. To show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And you'll find that the major part of this book is completely, completely, completely prophetic. The things that will come to pass. Isn't that what, you know, the Lord himself called the book at the end? He calls it prophecy. Uh, come on to uh, the last chapter now. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I'm reading to you from verse 18 and verse 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book the things which must shortly come to pass the book is prophetic if any man shall add unto these things god shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy it tells us in verse 18 is prophecy it tells us in verse 19, it's prophecy. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And so then you understand that uh, this is completely prophetic. And these things will soon be fulfilled. When it says will shortly come to pass, you are wondering because now, about 2,000 years have gone. Because he got this AD 96. And this is 2002 already. And you're wondering, it says, must surely come to, must shortly come to pass. Yes, you ought to remember. Be not ignorant of this one thing that one day will the Lord. It's like a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Second Peter 3 8. So then, this prophecy in the Revelation will certainly come to pass not a syllable not a jot not a tittle not a dot of an i not of a not a cross of a t will fail until everything comes to its final full complete fulfillment i come to point number three the reward of just justified christians the reward of justified and just christians as we look at the book of Revelation, and we were told immediately in the introduction, in chapter 1, verse 3, the blessedness of, you know, some kinds of people. Who are the people that are blessed in relation to the book of Revelation? I'm looking at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, he, singular, that readeth, and they that hear, plural, they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are reaching therein for the time is at hand. Uh, you, you will see the language that the Lord used there. Blessed is he that readeth. Uh, first of all, you know, John was supposed to write unto each of those seven churches and those leaders were to take the whole book, the whole prophecy, and they were to stand before the church. And uh, for even accepting to read it to the church, to the people, blessed is he, singular, that readeth. 
you know there was no printing at that time that everybody will have a copy and therefore somebody the minister the pastor the preacher the leader has to stand there and read and the lord said preacher pastor teacher leader you are blessed just for reading it to them blessed is he that readeth and our church and they that hear the words of this prophecy the people that sit down there and they didn't have copies in hand like you have copies now they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep not just to read and hear not just to understand intelligently intellectually but you read you hear and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand uh, that's what blessed blessed is he that readers blessed are they that hear and blessed are they that keep the things which are written in this book do you know that the, this book of revelation in the first chapter it opens with blessed do you know that in the last chapter it closes with blessed Therefore, the book of Revelation is not something we run away from. If a book opens with blessedness, and that same book closes with blessedness, and then there's something to that. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the things, the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You see there again, it's talking about the blessedness, but the blessedness is only conferred on the people that keep the things that are written in this book. In verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments. It tells you then the emphasis when he talks about the blessedness. He that readeth, they that hear and keep those things which are written in this, in the book of this prophecy, blessed in verse 14, chapter 22, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right, privilege, authority to the tree of life, and that they may enter in through the gate into the city. Uh, actually, as you look at this uh, book of Revelation, do you know that the word blessed comes up, is used seven times? times in this book of Revelation. And you know that that, what, that number seven symbolizes completeness, completion, and fullness, perfection. And look at it. Revelation, I'll start again from chapter one, Revelation chapter one, verse three. And look at the use of the word blessed. Revelation one three, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand chapter 14 revelation chapter 14 in verse 13 revelation 14 13 and i heard a voice from heaven saying unto me right blessed are the dead which Die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. You know, again, the blessed people here are not the indolent, passive, uninterested, uninvolved people. They are the people that they get something done. And they labored for the Lord. And it says, their works do follow them. And then in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. That means, he'll come suddenly. He'll come unannounced. He'll come uh, without uh, giving proud notice that, uh, you see, I'm coming, I'm coming. It says, he's coming suddenly. And he tells us in that Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and he see shame. Again, the blessedness is not on, you know, uh, the, the 
plastic people, indolent people, immovable people, people that will not bulk, people that will not do anything. The people that are making an effort and the people that are doing everything there is to be done so that they keep their garments from being soiled. It says, blessed are those people. And then when he comes, he will come and then he'll find them watching and he'll take them to glory above. Revelation chapter 19. Reading verses 8. And nine, Revelation nineteen, verse eight, and to her, and, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed, clothed in fine in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is a is the righteousness of the saints. And he says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says unto me, These are the true saints of God. You know, the people that keep their garments white, unsoiled, by the practices of the world, and by the evil things of the world. Blessed. Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, reading there from verse 6. Revelation 20, reading in verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. In Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, Verse 7, blessed, sorry, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the says of the prophecy of this book. And then in verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So then you understand as we, as we come to this book, the blessedness there is in this book. And as we talk about the blessedness of the people, we'll come back to this in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that keep, the, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep and keep and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand I want you to think about that word keep keep you see reading that's something hearing that's important but the ultimate goal of reading and hearing is to keep those things which are written therein. That's what keep is used three ways. Three ways, three different ways. Number one is to guard something. When you are told to keep, guard it. Number two, it's used in the sense of to treasure, treasure something. Keep this, treasure it. Number three, it's used in the sense of obey. They that keep, they that obey. Uh, look at it uh, one by one. Uh, to keep means to gird. To keep means to gird. Uh, look at First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. And then in verse 20. First Timothy 6, 20. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane, profane and vain babblings and the opposition of science falsely so called. Timothy, keep this. Guard it. That's what it means. In 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. That keep their means to guard, guard that thing. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear 
the words of this prophecy and the people that keep the things that are reaching therein for the time is at hand. Guard it. Number two is to treasure it. When it says keep, keep, treasure in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 verses 20 and 21. Proverbs 4 verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Treasure this thing. Treasure this thing. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Keep it in such a way that you know your heart is even feeling it. Make it a treasure. Let your heart be there. In Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 verse 19. In Luke chapter 2 verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. All the things that have been said about Christ. Mary uh, was, was so surprised, amazed, that she will be the virgin that the Lord will grant the opportunity. And eventually, Joseph took her, but didn't know her until Jesus was born. And then when Jesus was born, uh, they, they took Jesus to the temple. And then Simeon said, now, let your servant go in peace. For mine eyes have seen the Redeemer that you promised the Savior, that you promised unto Israel. And then everybody came and, and they said this and they said this. And Mary treasured all those things in her heart. Kept those things in her heart. The word keep, number one, is to guard. Number two, is to treasure. Number three, is to obey. When it says, you keep, you keep, you keep, obey. In First John, First John, chapter 2. First John, chapter 2, reading there from verse 3. Here we now see the, the other use of the word to keep, which simply means, literally means, to obey. In First John, chapter 2 and in verse 3 and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments if we obey his commandments he that says I know him and keepeth not and obeys not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoso keepeth whoso obeyeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. There he is telling us that we're to obey. When he says keep, it means obey. In first John chapter 3, verse 22. First John chapter 3. Verse 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep, because we obey his commandments, and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. So then when it says that uh, we're to keep his commandment, it's talking about obeying that commandment. Yes, you get it, yes, you treasure it, and yes, you obey those commandments. We're excited about the study of this great book. And it promises special and supernatural blessings to those who will read, who will obey, who will keep, who will gird, who will treasure, who will obey its contents. Come back to Revelation now. Revelation, I'm reading to you from chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which he gave unto him, which God gave unto him. Isn't this something? That the secret thing, the hidden thing, the mystery of the kingdom, that Almighty God will give it unto his only begotten Son. The glorification, 
the decision of heaven concerning the only begotten Son of the Father. And that God will let you in into this secret, the very treasure in the heart of the Almighty God, that God will let you in. See, when in the world they are maybe um, crowning a king, or when they are doing inauguration, and they say that this person is going to be sworn in as a president of a country. If, you know, they invite this and invite this and invite that. If you suddenly got a letter and they invited you and they say you must be there and come and see how the king, higher king, will now put in place this other king coming in. That letter, you treasure that letter. You keep that letter. You say, me, of all people, in this, our nation, they call me to come and view everything. See here, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the one that sits on the throne. Jesus Christ, that is about to be declared as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, that angels, they are viewing the glory of this coming Christ. And the Lord said, come on here and join the recipients, the people that will see the unveiling, the discovery, and the uncovering, and the manifestation, and the making visible of the glory of Christ, and he wants you to take part. This revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass, and he, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto John, his servant, who bear record of the word of God. The record here is the, is the will. When you read through, you will see sealed seven times. When somebody writes a will, a great man, and then he puts a witness to that will. And then they want to unfasten. They want to lose the seal. They want to open the seal. And they will not just allow every deacon hurry on the street to come and see the revelation, the unveiling, and, and the courting, and the disclosure of that will. And then you are called in that you should view the coronation, the exaltation, the glorification of this coming Christ, what a privilege you have. And John bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. How blessed I am that I am given the privilege to stand here and to read. How blessed you are to have a Bible in your hand and to read, if you are blessed reading only three verses, how blessed will you be reading one chapter? How blessed will you be reading chapters one, two, and three? How blessed will you be if you go to chapter four and it says, come up higher? How blessed will you see, will you be when you see the throne of God? When you see the angels of God? How blessed will you be when you read chapter six? When all those people that have rejected the Lord, they are hiding in caves, and then you are an observer of those rebellious people that didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, hiding in caves. How blessed will you be when you see that even Satan, in this revelation, as you go on to chapter 19, is bound and put in the bottomless pit. How blessed will you be when you even join Jesus Christ, when the books are open, and the record of the lives of everyone on earth is being read and you are there. You are not there to be judged. You are there even to be as a little judge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you know? We are going to judge the world and we are going to judge even the angels. How blessed will you be when New Jerusalem comes? And there you have read it over here and you are blessed for reading and you are blessed for hearing and you are blessed for keeping, for gaining, for treasuring and for obeying the word and you see New Jerusalem coming. And then how blessed will you be when the Lord stands at that gate and he says, enter in. And the names are called up yonder. And then you hear your name. You look around, you say, me? And then you see angels. And you see the streets of gold. And you see the mansions of high. And then the Lord says, look at the place I reserve for you. Because you catch the things that are written therein. 
blessedness of all blessedness. The blessedness of the age. The highest thing that ever happened to the offspring of Adam. I pray you will be there. Blessed you see that three days. And they that hear the words that are written in the words of this book. And keep those things. The prayer I'm praying is that I will not only read, God will give me grace to keep the sin. And the prayer I'm praying for you, you will not only hear, you will keep the things that are written here. If you will do that, you'll be blessed on earth, you'll be blessed on the day of rapture, you will be blessed after the rapture, you will be blessed in going out, you'll be blessed in coming in, you'll be blessed in the church, you'll be blessed at home, you'll be blessed in your family, you'll be blessed everywhere. The sevenfold blessedness of Christ will be upon your life. Blessed is he that readeth, blessed are they that hear, and the people that keep the things that are written here.